Um, thank you very much. Thank you for, very much for giving me the opportunity to give this talk. I wish I could have come uh, to India, but I'm sure the opportunity will present itself in the near future. So um, after these two very nice talks about analytical in spiral approximations and numerical data for merger and ring down, I want to spend some time on talking about complete waveform models that um, somehow combine these two approaches um, in the era, of course, of gravitational wave detection. So I will have an, on, an eye on um, heavyish uh, binary black holes like GW15 or 914. But uh, Ajith also asked me to talk about um, accuracy room requirements and, and where are we going to um, in the future. I should say on the title side, it's, it's just my name. Um, and uh, some of the things I'll be saying are basically my own interpretation and my own um, uh, ideas about this topic. So this is not for the LIGO and Virgo collaboration, but still a lot of the results I'll be showing are, of course, the results of many, many people uh, in, in this great collaboration. Okay, moving on to slide two. Um, this is a fascinating topic, of course, for various reasons. One is, um, as I said already, that to predict the waveform of, say, a binary black hole for many, many orbits, including merge and ring down, we have to combine uh, quite different approaches. And you've had nice introductions um, earlier today. Um, uh, but also, it is we need to cover a large range of uh, interesting effects. And one of the most challenging and fascinating effects at the moment, I think, is shown in the bottom panel is uh, precession when the spins are misaligned with the orbital angular momentum and the orbit uh, uh, moves around as the binary um, coalesces. This leaves a measurable imprint on the gravitational wave signal through in spiral and to some extent to merge and bring down as well. And uh, somehow we have to combine all these things to an accuracy level that we can then later confront models with the data and extract this sort of information. Moving on to slide three, um, now with a bit more focus on the recent discovery of the binary black hole by LIGO and Virgo, or by the LIGO detectors, of course. Um, in this analysis, we have used a variety of models that are uh, try to put in this um, sort of diagram. They come from basically two uh, modeling approaches, modeling camps, if you want. One is the effective one body approach that Guillaume has already um, introduced us to. And the other one commonly goes under the name of phenological modeling. And there are a variety of models coming from each of these uh, approaches. Um, the phenological model has, has really been pioneered by, by Ajith, this term at the AI and now is pursued by a number of people. Um, and the latest incarnation for an alignment spin model just came out last year. It's called IMAFNOM D, so you can tell that there were some models before. And uh, on the EOB side, there are various numerical relativity tuned versions that have these technical names. And for the um, analysis of GW15914, SUNR V2 was used. And then there are the precessing approximants in each camp. And if you go to the next slide, which is still labeled slide three, um, I've indicated with arrows um, how these models are related to each other because they're not all completely independent. And uh, there's a clear relation between the aligned and the processing uh, versions um, um, of, of these models. And that was the, well, I, I want to say it was a breakthrough insight that Harold was talking about that um, um, various people um, Patricia Schmidt, Richard O'Sornesy, um, Mike Boyle, and, and others, I'm surely forgetting some people here, um, found a few years ago. And that is that processing waveforms can be modeled quite accurately by using not processing waveforms and just rotating the waveforms appropriately. And the rotation that we need uh, is, of course, the, um, the precession of the orbital plane um, for a fixed observer. But there's also some amount of information flowing in the horizontal direction. Um, for non models uh, these days use some EUB waveforms to uh, inform their in spiral. And in, to, to some extent, the same numerical relativity waveforms are used on both sides. So they're not completely independent, uh, even though they, um, they, they, of course, in the details, use very different techniques. 
So uh, if you want to use the coffee break after this talk to uh, start doing your own model on slide four, I've tried to sketch in somewhat simplified way how you can do this if you want to follow the EUB approach. And uh, what you should learn from this slide is that it's, it's a fairly complicated procedure. The, the idea, on the other hand, is quite simple. On the top left is an analytic in spiral description here based on the effect of one body formulation. On the top right is a numerical relativity um, that presents information in terms of data, really. And um, in the middle, you want to combine these to obtain a model that dis you know, describes the entire signal. And the way this works in the effective one body approach is that the analytic um, uh, description is extended with typically higher order terms um, that are unknown in the analytic framework, at least at the moment, but they can be determined by comparing to numerical relativity predictions. And um, what you end up with is a modified and extended, if you want, um, EUB formulation. And this, if you attach then a, a ring down, um, certainly uh, gives you basically directly the non-processing model, or if you rotate this non-processing model then and attach the ring down afterwards, you end up um, with a precession, with, with a processing model. On slide five, as a similar, um, equally complicated um, sketch for the phenological approach. And again, on the top left, you have post Newtonian type information on top right numerical relativity um, data. What I want to highlight here is that typically in the phenological approach, these things are combined on a level of data. Um, hybrid waveforms are produced that are um, this waveform data that is produced by post Newtonian or effective one body approximants for the in spiral and then complemented with numerical relativity data. And these set of waveforms are then described by some phenomenological fits. And this is where the name um, comes from, uh, which of course also use information from the ring down. Um, what is not so clear in this approach is once you have a, a non-processing model, how do you rotate it? Um, and this is uh, really a field of active research in the model that we're using at the moment. The, the dynamics of the uh, orbital plane are very much inspired by post-Newtonian um, theory, even though we use it through merge and ring down, where it shouldn't be valid, but it seems to work. But um, in, the, in the near future, this should really be tuned to uh, uh, have a, a greater set of processing simulations that we have now. Okay, moving on to slide six. Um, as I said, in the analysis of uh, GW150914, a number of models have been used, um, in particular for the uh, for the estimates of the parameters, and um, two are reported in the uh, paper of the LIGO Virgo collaboration. One is the Align Spin Non-Processing SUBNRV2 model. This is the first column, column, and the other one is the IMR Phenom P, a processing model uh, in, in the middle. And uh, uh, you don't have to memorize all these numbers, they will be updated soon anyway, uh, without significant changes, of course. Um, but what I want to point out is that even though these models are quite different in the way they've been constructed and in the physics that they model, the numbers that come out are remarkably similar, which of course gives us great confidence in the individual results. And indeed, the collaboration has decided that the overall result, our best estimate of what GW150914 is, is a combination of uh, um, these two results, results based on an alliance spin UB model and on a processing phenom model, um, combined with equal weight, or, not, or just you know, if you want just averaged, um, and what you find then in the column labeled overall is the maximum posterior value, the best guess for what the values are. Um, and the first set of plus minus are the statistical uncertainties. Um, and the second set of plus minus values are the systematic uncertainties derived from the difference of these two models. And again, just pick your favorite number and you will find that the systematic uncertainty is in most cases, by, roughly by an order of magnitude, smaller than the systematic 
sorry, the systematic uncertainties smaller by order of magnitude than the statistical uncertainties, which is great. So our ability to identify the properties of GW150914 is not limited by the accuracy of the waveform models. And I think this, in my view, this is an absolutely fantastic result of this first observation. Moving on to slide seven, here are some bullet points, just repeating what I've just said. Um, so the question really is, are the models that good in general, or have we been lucky with this um, observation? And um, if you move one slide further, still on slide seven, the way um, we want to quantify this, how good are the models, is of course based on the likelihood that is used both both in finding gravitational wave signals and extracting parameters. And this likelihood is based on an exponential um, of the difference of data and a model waveform. Um, and this distance is uh, uh, based on an inner product that I'm sure most people in the audience have seen um, a million times. But I give it here for completeness. And SN is the noise spectral density. So we have to assume a specific instrument um, to make these estimates. Moving on to slide eight. Um, how do we use these inner products now to say something meaningful for our ability to search for gravitational wave signals and extract parameters? Well, um, for searches, it's a bit simpler. What you want, of course, is that the manifold of models um, coming from one of these specific models actually describes um, as close as possible the manifold of signals. So what you want is that every conceivable signal in nature is described very closely by by a model waveform, but also every model waveform is close to a real signal. Otherwise, you would just in increase your false alarm rate. And the quantity that is often used to describe that is the normalized inner product between HE, uh, the which I call it an exact um, waveform here, with HM, uh, the model waveform. And the cube of that is indeed um, to, to some approximation, um, a, a quantity that tells you how many signals you lose by imperfect modeling. Um, to calculate this properly re requires this maximization procedure, which can be computationally quite expensive. But even without the maximization, just calculating uh, normalized inner products uh, tell us immediately something about how many signals would we lose uh, given the model uncertainty at hand. To understand the influence on parameter estimation, this is a bit um, complicated because here parameter estimation is based on um, estimating the posterior probability density function um, around a given signal. Um, and so what one can do at first order is to estimate the systematic error in individual parameters. And this is this um, delta theta here. Um, on the second to last line, and then you have to project this onto the manifold. Um, so again, this is quite complicated and requires a lot of information about your waveform model. So what people have used in the past, and you can find in the literature quite often, are somewhat simpler, sufficient criteria that say if your wa waveform model error delta H um, is less than one, the norm of it is less than one, then this means um, it's an it effect is of the order or smaller than a typical noise fluctuation, so you can neglect it. And, and we will see um, how these two search and parameter estimation criteria um, affect the accuracy targets that we have to set for wafer models. But this is enough uh, theory for the moment. Let me move on to actual numbers, actual results. On slide nine, I'm coming back. Um, to one of these models that have been has been used in the analysis of GW15914 and will be used for further analysis in LIGO, the aligned spin IMR phenom D model. And what you see in the plot is this normalized inner product, uh, which is called often called match because it optimizes over time and phase, um, as a function of the total mass. And since we want to compare to the exact waveform, but of course we don't have the God given waveform at hand, our best replacement for that are, as Harold 
um, told us nicely, uh, numerical relativity simulations, all hybrid waveforms in this case. And you see there are a number of curves uh, depending on the value of the spin uh, and so on. But you see that really most of the errors, most of these matches are below, some of them far below the 1% uh, match threshold. There's one case that sticks out, which is the mass ratio 6 non-spinning case. And to be honest, uh, our suspicion is that this high match is a problem with a hybrid and not with a model. But this has to be seen. Um, on the next slide, we see a very similar plot for the um, EUB um, aligned spin model compared against 136, again, an impressive number of numerical simulations that has been used to compare here. And again, we find that the vast majority are around or below the 1% mismatch um, level. Some of them are higher. These have been identified as mostly high spinning systems, um, somewhat high mass ratio and high spinning systems. And a lot of work has been pursued, in particular at AI GOM, to improve this model. And on slides, well, on the next slide, still slide nine, uh, we can see the next incarnation of SUBNR aligned spin model, which will probably be called version four. Uh, these mismatches greatly improve and are again almost entirely below um, the 1% mismatch barrier. So this, this looks quite nice. Um, on slide 10, again, similar numbers for processing models. Here things become more complicated uh, because for processing models, now the, the, the morphology of the waveform becomes orientation dependent. If I look face on, onto a um, system where the orbital plane is wobbling slightly, it very much looks like a simple non-processing waveform. If I see the um, signal edge on, uh, the modulation is clearly visible, so modeling becomes harder. And this is what you see on the left-hand side um, for matches of the IMR phenom P waveform model. These angles are exactly these orientation angles between the total angular momentum and the line of sight. And you see around cosine theta equals zero, which is the edge on case. Um, matches are not, not certainly not as good as for the um, face on and face off cases, but, but they're still um, acceptable for searches. And the other um, processing model, as you will now be three on the right, has sky averaged wave um, matches against, again, a fairly large number of SXS waveforms and uh, we find less than 2% error or uncertainty here. Okay, a lot of, lot of numbers to hopefully convince you that, um, well, first of all, we have a lot of numerical simulations to actually perform this test, and the results that come out for the regions that we are testing here, I should say, are, are quite encouraging. And if we move on to um, slide 11, uh, we can try to interpret them um, a bit more we find in many cases the mismatch is more than 1%, or well, you cube this, which is, you know, first approximation is you just multiply it by three, means roughly 3% signal um, loss. Uh, that's the worst case. And this is, of course, still less than the 10% signal loss that we accept simply from a discretized template bank that's used in LIGO and Virgo searches. We know, of course, that if the physical configuration of the binary becomes more extreme, if we think about higher mass ratios, higher spins, um, very strong possession viewed uh, edge on, then these mismatches go up. So this might introduce some selection bias, um, but it is it is weak for most for the most likely sources, which means sources viewed face on, uh, not too extreme. Um, mass ratios, if we can believe population citizen models and so on. So I, I would say, in summary, for detection, we're doing uh, quite well. Again, for parameter estimation, what's that mean for parameter estimation? This is more difficult to assess just from these matches alone, because we have to think in terms of what um, bias is introduced by these matches. And um, Something that was discussed in a number of papers, and I think very nicely explained by uh, the Baird et al. paper in 2012, is that if we approximate the likelihood function um, quadratically, then we can find a nice criterion, and that is 
inside a p-credible region, now we're talking Bayesian parameter estimation, inside a 90% or 60% credible region, the difference, the distance between the best waveform or the signal waveform and the model waveforms that are in this region are less than the chi-square value um, when the cumulative chi-square distribution reaches this p-value in k dimensions. And under further assumptions, you can turn this into the equation that is after this arrow that says the mismatch, one minus the um, normalized match, has to be less than this chi-square value divided by twice the SNR squared. And th this would give you the level of disagreement that is within a p-credible region. And you, you see immediately it falls off as SNR squared. So the parameter estimation accuracy requirements that we are facing depend on um, how loud the signals are. If the signals are not very loud, we can get away with you know, more approximate models. If the signals are loud and there's a lot of physics to extract, obviously the uh, waveform models have to live up to um, higher accuracy standards. And just to do a sanity check, if you use this equation and put in the numbers for G GW1509.14, SNR is about 25, and we are thinking about, say, one-dimensional 90% credible regions, just as the one that I um, um, showed on a few slides earlier that are presented as the, as the results of the properties of the source. We find that in this region, according to the simplified formula, waveforms that differ by a mismatch of, of less than 0.2% are explored, which is a lot less than the 3% mismatch you find when talking about detection. And uh, as a further sanity check, actually, I went ahead and looked at the samples, the stochastic samples from MCMC chains and so on. And under under a few assumptions that I don't want to go into detail, I checked that in the analysis of GW1509.14, is, is this actually true? What what variation of waveforms is actually in this 90% uh, curve region? And it turns out, depending on what parameter I look at, if it's total mass or individual masses and so on, I find that indeed between 0.17 and 0.35% mismatch is the typical variation of this uh, of waveforms in this 90% credible interval, which um, which means that the simple accuracy criterion for parameter estimation is actually quite good. Um, but, but in reality, of course, there are some, um, some slightly different numbers one, one, one has to take care of. Okay, moving on to slide 12. Um, you, you can read this equation um, d differently. You can say, given the match I find between numerical relativity waveforms and models, what is the SNR up to which um, I can use these models for, for parameter estimation without violating this criterion. And Prayush Kumar has recently um, pu published a very nice paper on this. And you you see these numbers here for EOB and phenom D. The columns are mass ratio one, two, and three, and the uh, the, the three dimensional um, coordinate system are the two spins. These are line spin models, the two spin magnitudes, and the total mass. And you find if you look at the axis that in some corners of the parameter space, especially higher spins, the SNR at which you would violate this criteria is actually not that high. You know, you, you see blue points here around SNR 6, 8, 10, um, and okay, this is for a 68% confidence interval, for 90% confidence would be a bit larger, but not by much. So clearly the message here is that our models are just about okay for weakish um, signals. Um, but the moment they become much louder, it's not at all clear um, that the models are accurate enough. Moving on to slide 13. Um, as I said, parameter estimation have a lot more demanding requirements uh, for waveform models. And we should expect in the future signals with higher SNRs and more challenging regions than the the parameter space region around GW 14. In fact, in some sense, it can't be less challenging. This this was the optimal starting signal, I have to say. But the error budget is complex. In these waveform models, a lot of individual ingredients go in, each coming with a certain error 
and, and Harold has mentioned in our resolution, in our extraction, um, there are, of course, analytical approximations, errors in how we combine these, these models, interpolation, extra, extrapolation, and, and so on. Each comes with some sort of mismatch. And in principle, we could, um, we could quantify, but it then becomes hard to interpret what is really happening. And uh, a thing that I haven't mentioned so far, but I'll talk a little bit about towards the end, is that, of course, also these models use some simplified physics. Precession dynamics are simplified by using an effective precession spin. Higher modes are often either not, not included at all or, again, simplified. There's no eccentricity in these waveform models that I've talked about. So, so how can we quantify all these effects together? And um, fortunately, again, there's been a lot of work recently to prepare an end-to-end -end pipeline uh, where we can test this by injecting our best waveforms, again, derived or directly using um, numeric relativity waveforms. We inject them into either LIGO noise or zero noise, but use the LIGO noise curve and perform the exact same parameter estimation analysis that we do on on real and signal candidates, and we just see we just see what happens. Do we recover what we know we've injected? Slide 14. There are results we see on the top left that in our resolution really does have almost no effect on, on parameter estimates at all. On the lower left, we see higher modes do have an effect, um, and and the way you should read this plot is is if you go from the solid line to the dashed line. Um, sorry, I get confused <laughs> every time I look at this plot. If you go from blue to orange, this is when the source either has um, a higher modes in it or not. And of course, real sources will have all the higher modes. And we see that for phase on, it's not so much of a problem for the most signals we see it's not so much of a problem, but for um, edge on signals. Th this is in indeed indeed a problem, and we will and we could encounter systematic biases in our parameter estimates if we don't include higher modes. And we find this dependency on the inclination angle uh, in various studies, and, and the plot on the right shows the the parameter estimate of the mass ratio when we vary the inclination angle to a numerical relativity simulation, which parameters are given at the top. Um, and, and we find that, indeed, um, our processing models are good for a large range of inclinations where the processing imprints are not that strong. But for edge-on cases, they're not performing well, and we, we would have to expect a systematic bias in here. So um, only a few minutes left. Let me come to my conclusions and, and say, what are we doing with all these results? Well, I want to point out first that, of course, for GW15 or 914, this is, this is not a problem. There are no indications for strong precession. So we are either viewing a precessing source roughly face on or face away, or it's a non-precessing source, and then we don't have this problem anyway. OK, but moving on to slide 15, what do we have to do to get ready for the future? Um, as I said, processing waveforms viewed edge, edge on um, are not modeled to the accuracy that, that is required to extract the most physics. And um, one contribution is higher modes. And um, there's a nice plot that I took from Varma et al. Um, from two years ago that shows that not just for processing system higher, higher modes are important, but also towards higher masses and higher mass ratios. And there have been a number of, of good studies in the, in the recent past showing in which corners of the problem space higher modes do become important. And there's active development, including these in um, effective one body models. In non, uh, at the moment, in non-spinning phenological models, there's something that's um, pursued here in Bangalore. Um, or you know, simply by using numerical relativity waveforms directly that, of course, include all the higher modes. On slide 16, eccentricity, um, even though we might not expect um, systems, if they're formed in isolation, to have a lot of eccentricity in, in the LIGO band, of 
course, we want to test it and we want to be ready uh, to measure the systems that do have some eccentricity. And for that, um, one has to extend the, the, the waveform models um, to include these extra dynamics. And a lot of work is underway by Mark Favata and, and collaborators, again, in the group in, in Mumbai, and Gopakuma and, and collaborators are working on both inspire approximants, where, of course, um, eccentricity has a greater effect than the short um, merger. Um, and um, But what we see for uh, signals like GW150914, which is a, so, sort of a high mass system, is that their low eccentricity below roughly 0.1 um, is basically indistinguishable from the signal we see. But we can only make, of course, these statements now um, now that we have analyzed eccentric approximants or eccentric numerical relativity waveforms. And this is the plot that is shown on the right. Um, as you go towards higher and higher eccentricities, the uh, likelihood and um, measure of how well the model agrees with the data goes down. Okay, moving on to slide 17. Numerical relativity simulations are not the bottleneck of the waveform models we are using. And I think this should have been clear from Harold's talk, but also from some of the things I said. So when numerical relativity simulations become more and more efficient, longer and longer, and we observe high mass systems, of course, there's, there are prospects to use them directly to either build surrogate models, um, as Jonathan Blackman, for instance, is, is working on very actively or to basically directly confront numerical relativity data with um, instrument data or with reconstructed signals. And these are the plots that you see here. On the top left, a study that Richard Shaughnessy is leading by comparing a large number of NR waveforms with, uh, with the LIGO data. Um, and on the right, um, something that is rep reported in the Burst Companion paper, where a number of uh, Georgia Tech numerical relativity waveforms have been compared to a, a reconstructed waveform. And, and this is basically, at the moment, this is to convince ourselves that there's no surprises. Even if we use the numerical relativity directly, we confirm what we found with approximate models. But in the future, this could be the way to extract physics that otherwise we can't. Okay, moving on to slide 18, my last slide. I think to answer my question that I posed earlier, models are getting more and more accurate, and they're extremely accurate in some corners of the problem space. But of course, we've also been lucky with GW 150914, many reasons. And um, with the advances in analytical and numerical relativity, models will become more accurate naturally over the years. People know what they have to do. But I have to say, I don't think we should expect one single model covering everything, eccentric, double processing, inspiral merger, ring down models with matter effects and you know alternative theories. Um, for the highest in us that we will be expecting. I think really we should be aware and use the variety of different model thing approaches that all come with different timelines and different accuracies um, to extract the most physics, maybe in a hierarchical um, process. And we have the tools to do this. We have the, 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 the knowledge to estimate the accuracy with both simple um, um, requirements and extensive end-to-end -end tests. And I think this altogether will, will guide us towards extracting all the physics that we can from future observations. And when I gave a similar talk two years ago, I was a bit worried that all these mismatch numbers, would they really live up um, to reality? But now that we have GW150914, I'm very confident that for future observations, um, models will improve as, as they need to. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thanks, Frank. Uh, are there any questions for Frank? Okay, so thanks. So, the, so let's thank all.